As a Midwesterner, I've had my entire life to observe the traits of a culture that spans across the lowly populated areas of America, and there are a few things that, to me, stick out like a sore thumb. Of course, one of the biggest just so happens to be our avoidance of what I like to call black box topics. This usually includes sexuality, money, religion, and politics. It's frankly a very brain-dead way of going about difficult discourse. So to back up a bit, Midwestern social culture is a lot about keeping to yourself, not bothering someone over the little things, and not getting into anyone's business. This doesn't keep your occasional American from being visually and audibly loud and obnoxious, but even then, the chances that someone is going to call you out for that kind of thing are minimal. The Midwest's keep-to-yourself culture oozes its way into social interactions, and like jazz, it's less about what you do and more about what you don't do. Well then, what's the big hubbub about these black box topics? Why are they so important, and why does the Midwestern social culture hammer into our minds that such things should be avoided? I'd argue that these four topics, in one way or another, are connected to traditional ideals that are uncomfortable to question. Sexuality can be under the umbrella of such things as contraceptives, abortion, or LGBT topics. As for money, one might get too close to questioning capitalism if such discussions were followed to their conclusions. Politics, as many stubborn people hold views that follow tradition, or the general politics of their parents and the state they live in. And religion? I doubt that one needs explaining. Disallowing the discussion of these important topics is a factor of control. If sexuality isn't discussed, then your school has complete power over whether you get abstinence-only schooling or real sexual education. If discussions about money are suppressed, it's much harder for people to sympathize with the struggles of lower-income citizens, and can make it harder for employees under the same employer to realize they're not being paid fairly across the board. If religion isn't discussed, people won't realize that there are other religions than just Abrahamic religions, and that some terrible people hide behind the Bible to mask being bigoted. If political discussion is silenced, then we will never learn how to maturely discuss pressing issues, and we stay very ignorant of basic historical facts. This is all just the tip of the iceberg, but my general point is you can't ban anything. Banning drugs leads to misuse, banning abortions leads to many unsafe ones, banning firearms can lead to people buying them off the black market, but most importantly, banning certain kinds of speech leads to a mentally numbed populace. For the rest of this video, I'm going to elaborate on how specifically these four black box topics can harm us when we avoid discussion of them. Firstly, and this will be a quick one, religion. As I said before, an open discussion about this topic would make it a lot harder for bigots to hide behind religious ideology as their reasoning for discrimination. To be honest, I find this cowardly. One could just simply admit to being bigoted, but instead try to look for a reason to hide behind so the blame would instead fall upon the institution of religion instead of themselves as an individual. Additionally, more open discussion about religion would break the cycle of indoctrination that is the passing down of religion, or that you get yours usually from your parents. The problem I have with this is firstly that young people of a society don't have the capacity to understand religion, and instead usually believe in it to impress their parents or gain brownie points with the community. But secondly, religion should be chosen based on unbiased theological study. One should learn about every belief system there is to be offered and pick one from there. Not only does this save someone the hardship of having to leave a religion later in life, which devastates their clergy, but it gives one insight on other religions and forms a sense of oneness with other beliefs, making it harder to discriminate against other belief systems. Getting to sexuality, this seems to be a topic that more parts of the US ignore than just Midwesterners. There are an insane amount of downsides to avoiding discussions about sexuality. Of course, one of the biggest being the increase in teen pregnancies when a school decides to teach abstinence only, instead of legitimate sexual education. People are gonna fuck before marriage. Might as well teach them how to use contraceptives before they piss off conservatives again when they have to get an abortion. Teen pregnancies and contraceptives aren't the only important facets of the discussion on sexuality. Whether or not we teach LGBTQ plus topics in classes about sexuality and sexual health has been a political topic for some time. On one hand, you have chuds whining that this will indoctrinate their kids, but on the other hand, I see this kind of education being extremely important. Not being taught about homosexuality doesn't keep someone from being homosexual. It just keeps them from understanding how they feel. It would have been really cool to figure out that I was polyamorous and pansexual in school, but no. I instead was shown a sexual anatomy video in elementary where the only part I remember was how I laughed every time they said penis. Anyways, different identities should be taught in school sexuality classes, and myths should be debunked there too. America was once in a time where we all thought AIDS was spread by simply touching someone, and then homosexuals had literally thousands of sexual partners. Well, actually, we still live in an America where some people believe that, but wouldn't it be cool if they weren't brain-dead enough to believe that due to adequate sexual education? 
Lastly, to finish up on this topic about sexuality, it's my belief that both sexes should be taught about both reproductive systems. It's pathetic that so many men don't know what PMS is, or know so little about periods they think pad sizes refer to how big someone's coochie is. And now on to money. This one seems pretty common to avoid too, partially because being open about or flaunting one's socioeconomic status is looked down upon. It is both shameful and embarrassing to be openly poor, but also kind of douchey to be openly rich. As I described earlier, keeping quiet discussions about money can make it easier for an employer to pay people unfairly, giving the employer a higher ground in pay negotiations. This video elaborates more on what I mean. As for outside the workplace, a lack of discussion about money can keep many well-to-do people, or the middle class, from being sympathetic to people of other incomes and classes. For instance, when I was still in high school, I was talking with a kid in my class who had a father that had a well-paying job. The discussion got into how California is expensive and poverty in general. This kid, we'll call him Kevin for the sake of this video, told me that the poor have nothing to worry about, that they can move easily, especially if they get an employer that will pay for them to move like his dad's did. Of course, I knew this was a bunch of bullshit. One of my boyfriends had to move to my state because it was cheaper than California, and there was no way that his mother would have gotten a job here that would pay for her to move. That's rare. The problem here is that Kevin assumed that everyone else, including the poor, had the same opportunities that his dad did. This is called egocentrism, and it can lead a lot of middle to upper class people to believe that the reason the poor are poor isn't due to lack of opportunity, but instead laziness or foolishness. Hate is ignorance, and just as racism is a result of ignorance, so too is hate of the poor. Lastly, politics. Oh boy, do I have a lot to say about this one. So, setting aside my radical leftist biases, there is so much that could be gained from more conversations on politics. The way I see it, there are a lot of people who don't research a topic or don't have any nuance that still think their opinions matter. Like, I'm not going to give an opinion on a psychological or health subject unless I research it, because where else would I pull my opinion from? My ass? The same should go for politics. There are so many people that believe in basic myths such as the Nazis were socialist, or Stalin and communism killed 100 million people, or Antifa is fascist, or any radical politics are bad, etc, etc. Our historical education is insanely basic and leaves out lots of details or alters them to give you a different mindset of history that more so benefits your country than the truth. Biased historical education allows a country to put a lens on someone's view of the world as to keep them from having any thoughts or opinions that might harm power structures. It's never really fully explained why communism is bad in any of the history classes I was in as a kid, but that sure didn't stop many people from believing it was terrible without second-guessing it. Same for making tons of students believe that our country is the best, or that the ones we went to war with are barbaric, or that we have a functioning democracy. History isn't objective when there are many people who will interpret it differently. This is why discussion about history is so important. It allows us to challenge our views and expand our knowledge on a subject that is seldom properly taught in American public schooling. Here's the takeaway. There's a reason I hate this culture of avoiding black box topics, and it's an ideological power structure. By keeping people ignorant, you can rip them off as an employer, suppress sexual and economic freedom, and get your populace to follow the politics you want them to follow. We all need to understand, however, that avoiding a topic is lazy and we should instead be taught how to have conversations about difficult topics instead of outright avoiding them.